I really do appreciate the folks from World Vision and all the people from our church who have a part in that particular ministry. I was saying I know that they know what they're doing because they put the prayer walk later in the week after the day that you had to go all day just drinking water. Because when I went on my you know, prayer time, I was grateful to the Lord that the day I didn't get to drink any coffee, I didn't commit homicide. So I appreciate your involvement in that. I remember several years ago running into a church member at the store, and you guys know that generally speaking, I like to dress up. My parents always made a big deal about their kids looking nice. We were poor, although I really didn't know it, but we always had neat clothes and clean clothes. So that's just a part of my DNA. You guys, I'm sure, are familiar with what goes on in the church planting movement these days. And I tell you, I love these young guys that are planting churches all over the place. It is wonderful, and they are a great gift to the church universal. But church planters take a lot of kidding, and rightfully so. They're stereotyped because they wear skinny jeans, horn-rimmed glasses, they have tattoos, and in many cases they look like they just rolled out of bed about 10 minutes before they were to stand up and preach. In fact, it was years before I actually realized they had to work to get their hair that messy. I thought they just didn't comb it for months on end. But sometimes my church planter friends kid me about being too uptight. I don't know what they're talking about. I preached without a tie twice. <laughs> but they'll say to me, Ken, you, you just need to be yourself. You need to be authentic. Listen, starched is authentic for me. So anyway, most of the time I'm starched and creased and I'm very comfortable that way, except, you know, on my days off, so you guys get the picture. So I'm in the store and I happen to run into this lady that attends our church. And she was, it was this was a Saturday afternoon and I'm probably in shorts and sandals and a t-shirt with a sports logo and a baseball cap. And she looked across the way at me and then she looked again. And then she tilted her head, kind of looked, had that quizzical look. And I'm getting much more uncomfortable by the moment. And finally she comes over and then there's this moment of recognition and she says, oh, it is you. And I'm thinking, for those of you that remember Bob Newhart, I'm thinking in Bob Newhart fashion, yes, why, yes, yes, yes it is. <laughs> and then she said, I almost didn't recognize you. And she kept looking at my outfit, and I was feeling a bit like Lee Greenwood singing God Bless the USA in the middle of a Nike outlet store. <laughs> You'll get that around lunch. God Bless the USA. And finally she said, I guess I never realized you dress like regular people. You're, you're like everybody else. You're, well, human. <laughs> and I thought, ma'am, if you only knew. <laughs> now, this is a terrible connection to make, but I ran out of time, so this is the best I can do. I think you'll get it. We sometimes fall into the trap of thinking about people only a certain way. As it relates to faith, we sometimes fall into the trap of thinking about Jesus only a certain way. In fact, we spend so much of our time and focus thinking about the divinity of Jesus that we sometimes neglect the reality that Jesus was completely human. We neglect his humanity. He was a man. He dressed like regular people in his day. He was, in a way, just like everybody else, and in a way, obviously not like everybody else, in that he was God in the flesh. But he was in the flesh, nonetheless. In our text for this morning, we're going to see how very human Jesus really is. Now, stay with me, because this is going to take a little longer than usual to set the stage prior to our reading. So go ahead and turn to it, but don't stand just yet. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 26. You know we're in Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to start with verse 36, but we'll stand in just a few minutes. There are so many themes to pick up on from this particular text. It's really difficult, in fact, to hone in on what we should glean. 
In fact, I'm sure that during our trek through the Gospel of Matthew that I've had as much difficulty striving to narrow and then extrapolate things from this biblical text as anywhere else. Not because there isn't anything to glean, but really the opposite. There are seemingly countless things to be said about this text. It is literally a treasure trove of truth, even in determining a title. I found great difficulties. Some of you will remember a preacher from many years ago by the name of Larry Lee. He wrote a book that was popular many years ago called, Could You Not Tarry One Hour? And it was based on the text that we'll be reading. And that title crossed my mind. I considered calling this one Third Time Charm. There are a couple of things here related to the number three. You have Peter and James and John, that's three. You have the three exchanges in which Jesus is imploring his disciples to stay awake and pray. And then you have the three times that Jesus prays something along the same lines, praying about his impending suffering. Third time charm would have worked quite well. I could have called it, if it be possible, referring to Jesus' plea to the Father about this cup, which we will recognize is the cup of the full wrath of God that Jesus is called upon to take. I think it would have been legitimate to call this go and pray based on what Jesus says in verse 36. Watch with me would have worked too based on verse 38. I considered the spirit is willing and you know the rest because of what Jesus says in verse 41. I was thinking about how we know how very weak we are. So we get that the flesh is weak, but maybe we need a strong reminder about the willingness of the spirit. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your hour or your will be done or nevertheless would have worked too. I could have reminded you, and I'm doing this by even saying this, that Jesus' ultimate prayer was for obedience to the Father, even knowing it would cost him his very life, and that would cost him his very life in a way that none of us can ever begin to fathom. I could have picked on the disciples, and I thought about it for a moment. I could have called it found sleeping, but I don't think it's good to talk about sleeping in sermons in the same sentence. Hits a little too close to home for some of you guys. I thought about calling the sermon, The Hour is at Hand, as Jesus notes that it is in verse 45. I have a personal proclivity toward talking about the perfection of the timing of God. I even considered calling it the continuing saga of how to get a QT ice cream cone. But Lori reminded me it was time to let that go. In fact, I considered preaching several sermons from this text and utilizing each of these with somewhat different angles, but I remembered we've been in Matthew since Lyndon Johnson was in the White House, so I determined to forge ahead. I trust you can see some of the challenge here, literally. Where do we start? On what should we focus? How in the world do we even begin to narrow the scope of what to say? I considered calling this grieved and distressed based on the way the New American Standard Bible translates it, but I've opted to title the sermon Sorrowful and Troubled based on the overall picture and the way the English Standard Version as well as the Christian Standard Bible captures the words of Jesus, sorrowful and troubled. So no doubt the issue at hand is the distress of Jesus. He is sorrowful and he is greatly troubled. So all of the things, of all of the things with which we might benefit from related to Jesus' final night, I thought that it would be a good place to land. And the truth is, when we talk about sorrow and we talk about trouble, we land in everybody's front yard. So, from Matthew 26, beginning with verse 36, sorrowful and troubled, now would you join me as we stand for the reading of this beautiful text. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is, po if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. Sorrowful and troubled. Four things mainly that I want us to glean from the text, and I promise we'll move quickly. Number one, Jesus understands sorrow and trouble. Jesus understands sorrow and trouble. We get this from verses 36 through 39 that we read just a moment ago as Jesus goes with them to Gethsemane, and he even explains, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. So the group now moves to a garden or a wooded area on the western slopes of the hillside known as the Mount of Olives. Gethsemane means oil press. It was an area that was filled with groves of olive trees. Jesus then leaves the eight disciples and moves closer. He brings with him his inner circle, those three men, Peter, James, and John. And then he asks them simply to watch. Certainly, we understand as we read ahead into verse 41 that by saying watch, he infers and he means watch and pray. That is, stay awake and intercede along with me. We know this because verse 41 records him asking them to watch and pray. There's something beautiful that occurs when we pray, right? Thank you. And, and I don't in any way want to downplay the importance of private praying but listen carefully, there's something beautiful that occurs when we pray together, right? It's my contention, and I'm not alone in this assessment, that simply put, Jesus wanted the support of his closest comrades in his darkest moments. Remember, although he was fully God, and we've already established he was, but we also know he was fully man, and as a man, he is literally about to be under the gun in the proverbial sense. So it stands to reason he would desire the presence of his inner circle and implore them to simply pray for him. Jesus is overwhelmed with sorrow. It's late. He is in distress and misery, as some translations will say it, or he is crushed and anguished as some translators write in seeking to capture the sense of his emotional state, Jesus at this point knows of his coming death. He has a picture in his mind about what is about to take place. He can no doubt sense what just lies ahead. And he's greatly troubled. He's in distress. Verse 39 gives us a picture of the full humanity of Jesus and shows us the extent to which he was being tempted. Look at verse 39, and going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. As Craig Blomberg notes, in his sinless human nature, he clearly perceives the horror of his coming execution and very naturally and appropriately asks his father if there is any way out. As Jesus says, if it is possible, it most likely reflects a first-class condition which assumes it is possible as Jesus affirms afresh God's omnipotence. In other words, Jesus is saying, God, Father, if there's any other way, let's do that. But nevertheless, not what I want to be done, but I'm willing to be obedient to you even to the point of death. But as a man, Jesus will not allow his own preference to compete with the demand from his heavenly Father. He is completely tempted, please don't miss this, but he is completely obedient. Obedient. 
Notice again, please, verse 39, Jesus is praying. This is his petition. He is asking God the Father if there is any other way to accomplish this. Now, this speaks to several issues. But most importantly, I want to simply remind you that this offers a scriptural example of a prayer that God does not answer. Jesus prayed fervently. Jesus prayed in faith. Jesus prayed without sin. Jesus prayed boldly, but God didn't answer Jesus' prayer the way Jesus wanted. Now, that paragraph I gave you just then would put Benny Hinn and Creflo Dollar and Joyce Meyer out of business. It would. Jesus prayed sinlessly, boldly, fervently, but the Father didn't answer the way Jesus wanted him to answer. My point is to remind us about two things as it relates to praying. Pray with boldness. Don't hold back. Jesus didn't. Pray what you sense you should pray. Even if God doesn't answer it the way you want, pray with boldness, fervently, and then here's the second part. Don't blame God. And don't blame yourself. And don't blame others if God chooses not to answer your prayer as you desire. There are a lot of godly, faithful people who pray a lot, and God doesn't answer the way they wished He would answer. In fact, I'll simply say to you that the majority of the prayers I've prayed throughout my life have not been answered the way I've wanted them answered. I've prayed for a lot of people to be healed that have died. I've prayed for a lot of marriages to be fixed that have gone on to divorce court. I've prayed for a lot of prodigal children to come home and they're still out in the proverbial wilderness. There's one thing, one other thing that we need to, mo to note before we move on. But I want to make sure that we get through this slowly enough so that no one misunderstands. Let me just remind us again, Jesus was fully God. Agreed? And Jesus was fully man. Agreed? So I don't want to be crude in any way. But here's what that means. These are, at least at some level, the implications. If Jesus sneezed, he might need to blow his nose just like you and I. Now, I don't mean that, I'm not saying that to be crude or pedestrian in any way, I know, but he was man, fully man. If Jesus ate something that didn't agree with him, he might have a stomach ache, just like you would. So now, as we look at this description of Jesus, the Bible records he was sorrowful and troubled. He says, in fact, he says, his soul is sorrowful even to death. He's asking God, some would say begging, because he says it three times. At the least, he is imploring God to keep him from having to take on and fulfill this most painful task. And as you've read the other gospel accounts, and likely you maybe even have read other books on what was going on here, the deep anguish in which Jesus finds himself. Hold that thought. I'm a pastor, but I'm also a counselor. I had a long debate in my mind. I know I'm the only one that talks to myself. But I had a long debate in my mind whether or not to go into this because the danger is always for somebody to think that I think I know more than I actually do. Ask Lori, she'll tell you I don't know a thing. Sometimes, though, when we talk about counseling issues, people will think, for example, if I mention that, that I've determined to trade the Bible for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Look at me. I have not. I've not traded the Bible for the DSM-5 or whatever number we're on now. Moreover, sometimes when people hear any allusion to counseling, they think that one might be substituting the Word of God for the Word of Freud. Hear me carefully. Nothing could be further from the truth. It doesn't take a degree in counseling to see the depressed state that Jesus was in. 
He is sorrowful to the point of death. He is in despair. He is asking God to remove this cup from him. God the Father doesn't answer the way Jesus desired. My point in mentioning this is to simply remind you that one can be in despair, one can be sorrowful, one can be troubled, and dare I say it, one can be depressed without sin. There's a reason I say that. Some people might say, well, I, I just don't believe Jesus was depressed. And I remember the first time I heard someone say that, it kind of knocked me for a loop. And the reason some people might say, I can't believe Jesus was ever depressed, is either they don't know the symptoms, or in their own mind, depression is connected to something sinful. And that's something we as the people of God have to get past. I'm telling you in some cases, in many cases in fact, depression has absolutely nothing to do with sin. Now, if you want to make a depressed person more depressed, then by all means tell them the only reason they're depressed is because of their sin. And they'll say, thank you. There are circumstances people face that cause that kind of mental distress. Case in point, Jesus himself, he wasn't a sinner. There are chemical issues often that people face that bring about this dark cloud. So let's be really, really, really careful how we talk with and seek to minister to and come alongside those among us who deal with these kinds of things. Now, if I sin and I break fellowship with God, certainly that might lead me to depression because I've got a relational issue that's not right. I understand that. But I also know, as you also know, that for some people, just waking up in the morning and facing what they have to face will cause them to go into a spiral of depression. And Jesus was distraught. And I would say even perhaps depressed, but he never, never, never sinned. Clear? We can't grasp the suffering Jesus endured emotionally, spiritually, physically. This concept of sorrowful and troubled means he was in anguish, deeply distressed. G. Campbell Morgan, and I love what he does with this, G. Campbell Morgan says this phrase comes from a word that means far away from home. The idea of sorrowful and troubled comes from a word that means far away from home. You get the picture? Jesus came from heaven. He came from the throne. He came from total light to total darkness. Light is light in direct proportion to how much you've seen the darkness. And darkness is dark in direct proportion to how much you've seen the light. And nobody in the universe has known more light and more darkness than Jesus. Those moments in Gethsemane were awful. It was a terrible place to be because, among other things, Jesus was literally far from home. So you say, okay, great. What's the point? Do you ever get sorrowful? Do you ever get troubled? Do you ever find yourself in the depths of some kind of despair? Listen to me, listen to me. Tell Jesus. Tell Jesus. He, more than anybody else in the world, understands. So not only Jesus understands sorrow and trouble, but Jesus understands humanity and disappointment. Verse 40, And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Jesus understands humanity and disappointment. He's been praying, apparently, for about an hour. Let that sink in. I know. It speaks volumes about my often feeble efforts. What do you do in your life when things take a turn for the worse? And in the midst of things taking a turn for the worse, all of your friends let you down. What do you do? This is the one group Jesus was supposed to be able to count on. Do you think, based on what he went through here, that he understands humanity and disappointment? He does. He does. So when you're dealing with it, go to him. He 
understands. So he understands sorrow and trouble, humanity and disappointment. Thirdly, Jesus understands weakness and need. Verse 39, first of all. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Skip ahead to verse 42. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Skip ahead to verse 44. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Three times Jesus goes through this. Jesus understands weakness and need. He prays three times. Now, I know that as God, we would say Jesus needs nothing. But as a man, it's important for us to recognize Jesus expressed his need as a human being to his heavenly Father. The second time that Jesus prays, he uses a negative adverb with the first class condition and says, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, speaking, of course, of taking the cup of God's wrath, we know by this second time that Jesus, based on the way he says this, Jesus has come to accept it is not within the will of God that he avoid the suffering that God has laid out for him. So let me ask, how comfortable do you feel bringing your weakness and your need to Jesus? I talk to people all the time, and, and they would talk about what's going on in their life. And I'll say, have you talked to God about that? And they say, oh, I don't know that I could, I don't know that I could talk to him about that. Here's a newsflash. He knows. Right? He knows. Listen, to, your spouse knows. You don't think that he or she does? They know, oftentimes. Your needs, your weakness, the despair, the heartache, all the stuff that you're dealing with, if they know, and if you know, don't you think that God knows? So why in the world would you ever keep from talking to Him about that? Again, let me simply say, He understands, but I believe we need to bring our weaknesses to Him and allow Him to sort of come alongside, and if I can say it this way, wrap you in His arms and say, Child, I understand but you've got to bring it to him. And listen, because this is, this is my world, you've got to leave it with him. Can I get a witness? Don't just bring it. You've got to bring it, but then you've got to leave it. There's a beautiful poem called Broken Things. As children bring their broken toys with tears for us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. But then instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help with ways that were my own. At last I snatched him back and cried, How can you be so slow? My child, he said, What could I do? You never did let go. Jesus understands sorrow and trouble. Jesus understands humanity and disappointment. Jesus understands weakness and need. And if I left there, we'd all leave depressed. So we can't leave it at that. I want to give you a note of triumph. Jesus understands obedience and courage. Jesus understands obedience and courage. Verse 44 and following. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying, the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And hear the triumph in his voice. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus didn't run away. He understands obedience and courage. What does he do? He said the same words again, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Jesus understood obedience. Jesus will now face the cross. Notice the very last verse, complete resolve, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And he died. He died for us, for all people. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Before we ever thought about trying to get things worked out the right way, Jesus died for us. 
He gave up so we could go up. He defeated death so we could have triumphant life. He suffered greatly so we wouldn't have to. He died literally in our place. There was a Chinese Christian who happened to be a cook, and he was thrown into prison during the early part of the communist revolution in China. It was 26 degrees below zero. He had on padded clothes and a heavy fur-type coat. He got on his knees and he prayed. He said, Lord, I thank you that I'm warm in the midst of such cold. And about an hour later, there was another guy thrown into the same prison. But this guy was a pagan. He had been mocking Christians. He had been doing all that he could to make fun of their faith, and he had no coat. And after the Christian man had prayed, and then he sees this pagan man without a coat, brought to the same prison in the same conditions, he thought he heard God tell him, give him your coat. So he began to pray and said, Lord, if I give him my coat, I will freeze to death tonight. Reluctantly, the Chinese Christian man took off his coat and he gave it to the pagan. And the Christian man died that very night. Many years later, a group of Christians gathered in a clandestine way, and they were giving testimonies of their faith. And people were talking. They were standing up, taking turns, sharing the story of how they came to faith in Jesus and how they were saved. And finally, one man stood up and said, I'm going to tell you why I'm here. I'm here today because a stranger, a lot of years ago, gave me his coat. And he died so that I could live. That's what Jesus did, only so much more. Remember what Paul said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you by His poverty might become rich. And that's rich in the things of God. And that should move us to simply say, thank you. Thank you.